Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Any of that. You're... Okay, we're back. We're live. It's the 5 o'clock block. And today is Veterans Day in Hawaii and all over the country. In fact, all over Europe, too. The end of World War I, 100 years ago. Um, really remarkable time. And, and uh, Peter Hoffenberg and I would like to ruminate on exactly what happened uh, and what that means to us, what that has meant to us over the past 100 years. It's not without consequence. Welcome back to the show. Peter. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks for asking me. And I'll give you my, my usual disclaimer. OK, please. Right. So I do not represent the University of Hawaii, <laughs> the history department, members of my family. My parents of blessed memory, I only represent myself. <laughs> Thank you. Well, now that, that's Thank a you. full tilt. <laughs> that is. I, I, I've spent the morning with lawyers. So. Nevertheless, Thank you. <laughs> he's a history professor at UH Manoa. And I'm happy to talk about anything you'd like <laughs> about World War I. You always say that, and it always works out yep, that no, way. I'm more than happy to schmooze. Mm -hmm. OK, so my big recollection mm -hmm. about uh, World War I is Doris, uh, make that Barbara Tuckman in The Guns of August, right. uh, which uh, concerned the lead up, the events in Europe that led up to uh, to the war. And it was so interesting how it was, it was all a tripwire. One thing led to another. Before you know it, the war plans were called into effect, even if people really didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. They were sort of obligated by virtue of the war plans to have a war. And presto, they had a war that was different from all of the wars up to that point. You know, the War of the Roses probably involved <laughs> 500 people <laughs> and not a whole lot of casualties. And even if it was long, it wasn't all that consequential. This was different. Why was this war different from all, all the other wars? wars? All right. <laughs> Very good, Tom. You had a question. Um, first of all, to get back to uh, Barbara Tuckman, I think that's a, a good reference because, in a way, uh, she's provided the, the key argument about the idea that this war should not have happened and was somewhat of a tragedy or a folly. Now, we continue to debate that, but it's, I think it's good to remind uh, listeners and students that. Uh, Tuckman followed that up with a study of four other wars of which she thought were uh, follies. So that you could take that as the argument that they either stumbled into war. There's a recent book about sleepwalking into war. Uh, it could have been avoided. It should have been avoided. And it was an unnecessary tragedy. And I think probably, not to get into the absolute historical accuracy or not, that's probably even to this day still the dominant narrative or view, right? That all the soldiers went over the top with futility into no man's land for a quarter of, a, of an acre or a quarter of, of a mile. And look what happened then, we had World War II. So I don't necessarily think that that's historically accurate, but I would say that's the popular perception. And, and even to this day, I think, when people go to the monuments and such, and uh, much of what we know about in the West what we know about the war is from the trench poets, the very famous uh, trench poets. And they certainly uh, provide us with a sense of uh, futility, uh, often irony, um, and certainly a kind of uh, desperation. When you peel back uh, the facts of the time, so if you're interested in how we view it now, if we just stop for a second and look back in 1914, 1918, uh, not surprisingly, it's a lot more complex. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's more complex as far as the steps taken to go to war. Uh, it's more complex about uh, each country's aims. So for example, everybody likes to cite the Versailles Treaty and blaming Germany and having Germany pay for the war. Well, there's considerable evidence that Germany did have war aims. Uh, now, whether or not those war aims were worth the conflagration of 16 million, that's a different kind of question. Million? 16 million probably with civilians and soldiers. Um, I, and, I, and I don't mean to give you uh, an uncommitted answer, but as you know, um, the nature of the war tended to eviscerate the bodies. So what we generally have are crosses, crescents, Mogan Davids over uh, spots in which there may not be anybody buried. We have names. So when it gets the absolute numbers, it becomes a little more difficult. And this is really the war that gave us the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, right? The idea that modern warfare was so horrific on all different fronts that you could, and I, I don't mean to upset your audience, so I hope nobody's having dinner right now, but you could get uh, body parts and soil from different campaigns and put them into one tomb, and that represented the entire conflict, okay? So uh, in that sense, we begin to see how devastating it was, and it's very difficult sometimes to remember 
uh, that in 1914, uh, nobody thought it was going to last more than a couple of nobody months. Thought nobody thought it would be 16 now, million lives. No, and certainly they, uh, they thought that, uh, and it's some interesting, if we want to get into, you know, why they did not, I think is a very interesting historical question. What did they see in 1914? Well, how, how did they, you know, it's like uh, the beginning of the Civil War. Nobody thought it was going to last more than a couple of weeks. Right. Well, in 1914, um, and again, you know, we could have 10 historians here who would have 10 very good, important points. So I'm just going to give you, you know, my limited understanding. But I think a couple of things. Um, there really had not been a major war in Europe since the time of Napoleon. And one of the things we know particularly about European history is uh, <laughs> until after 1945, uh, Europeans were not always good about sustaining peace over multiple generations. So when they go off to 1914, most people, and, and there were plenty of peace movements as well, there were lots of anti-war movement, uh, many arrests, uh, a lot of the American and British um, dissent, anti-dissent laws come from this period. So it's not to say everybody went off, okay? Uh, but when they did go off, I think at least two things to keep in mind. Um, Actually, three, sorry, three. Let me give you three things to keep in mind. Uh, the intense militarization of almost every major European power and its colonies. What I mean by intense militarization was uh, the, the desperate gamble to build battleships, uh, the increase in the military budgets for all of them. So some historians, and, and, and you know, not, not without merit, argue that there was militarization, you know, an impulse to use these without any kind of memory of what would result. Yeah. Now, having said that, there was absolutely no memory of a, of a machine gun. But you know, you could have looked at the Napoleonic Wars, and many of you viewers have probably either seen or read War and Peace, or at least Woody Allen's Love and Death, which has <laughs> the Battle of Borodino in it. And those battles had 300,000, 400,000 troops. So the idea of a large number of troops being cut down is, is not unusual, but it was 100 years before. Uh -huh. Okay, so one argument might be the militarization. Well, uh, uh, and let me give you a third. Is... Let me give you a third one, though, because I think a third one, yeah. particularly for uh, many people in this community, I think would be of interest. Uh, there actually were precedents, so it's interesting as a historian to ask. For example, in Africa in the 1890s, there were a series of major battles where figures charged on horse or on foot into uh, very well defended areas with Maxim guns. And they were mowed down. Butchered down. The Battle of Omdurman, uh, probably after uh, five or six hours, there were uh, three to four hundred Anglo Egyptian casualties, and most historians estimate between 10 and 11,000 dervishers. If they had looked at the Russo Japanese War in 1904, 1905, they would have seen the horrors of trench warfare. So there are a couple of really interesting historical questions which I certainly would not you know, sell my print Mickey Mantle saying this is the absolute right answer. But there were precedents which could be seen. So as historians were often asking, why didn't those register? Because by 1915, 1916, it was like Omdurman, right? There were people charging over into well-entrenched trenches, trenches. Being mowed down. Right, being mowed down on both sides, right. <laughs> but as they headed off to war, mm -hmm. they marched, they sang, um, it was it was that old martial music kind of thing, right? And they had developed their you know, their weapons and their military militarism and all that, and and it, it, it strikes me that part of this must be, uh, again, Barbara Tuckman, is if you build a huge military mm -hmm. enterprise, uh, you're more likely to use it because you built it. Oh, there's a level absolutely. of commitment involved in building it. Uh, absolutely, and I think Barbara Tuckman and others have pointed out, it's a very old topic, but it's a very important topic, that the diplomatic relations required them to go and assist their ally, even if they were not attacked a themselves. Spider web, yeah. Right, and that had a deep impact on appeasement in the 20s and 30s, when Western countries were very reluctant to repeat that kind of, what was known as the alliance system. Yeah. Uh, and the alliance system was certainly held in part for political reasons, such as Germany did not want to fight a two-front war. Uh, the Russians and the French both wanted to demolish Germany. So there were practical political reasons. And there was also an old-fashioned idea that um, a diplomatic agreement was a contract, and you had to abide by it. That's why, to a great degree, it's, it's both comic and tragic 
when Neville Chamberlain returns with his piece of paper from Hitler, <laughs> right? Because they're still locked into the mindset that if you write it on a piece of paper, it's a contract and it's a commitment. And of course, part of fascism was to mock and to use diplomacy uh, for eventual expansionary military reasons mm. and use diplomacy mm. kind of as a timeout. Mm, we yeah. still have that, don't we? Well, yeah. there, there are a lot of echoes um, of the First World War, mo most certainly. I mean, you could look at probably if we were to have a, um, a high, challenging introductory history course of the 20th century, uh, almost every major development we can think of came from 1914 to 1919. It didn't make them inevitable, right? And it's, it's not necessarily where it was headed, but you could go back and see some of the grander narratives the, being- The implications. Yeah, and being um, unleashed during that war. You know, Woodrow Wilson, a mixed bag, and I sure, sure like your thoughts about him, why he took us there, um, and what he had in mind when he said a war to end all wars, mm -hmm. and when he created, at least, or tried to set up the League of Nations right. afterward. Um, uh, I, I, where does he fit in this? Because the United States was not of a single mind in those days. No, and as he found out, and you, you and your, again, your viewers well know, uh, the senators and the Senate destroyed that, and he essentially killed himself by campaigning <laughs> and got very ill campaigning. No, most certainly, um, and it reminds us that not everybody, you know, in 1917 was also for the war in the U.S. I mean, there was resistance. Um, most historians would say that uh, the reaction to Wilson uh, was a, a, an isolationist reaction. But I think that, um, you know, revisionism has a bad word because revisionism is sometimes equated with denial. So I want to give you a slightly revisionist view, which is not a denial. Um, I think most people, uh, and certainly uh, key figures in the U.S. during the 20s and 30s, were not particularly isolationists. They were tended to be towards Europe, but this is a period where the U.S. got involved in China, where the U.S. was deeply involved in Central America. So the isolation is um, selective, mm. what I talk to my students, mm. selective isolationism. And those are also areas where Wilson doesn't get a lot of flowery points. I mean, Wilson, as we know, had certainly strong racist views and um, it's hard to celebrate him on Veterans Day, isn't it? It's hard to celebrate him. Um, I think, though, if, if we just stop for a minute and try to look at people realistically, all right, um, and don't go, you know, in Judaism, if you refer to Hitler, you lose the argument, so don't, <laughs> right. don't call Wilson Hitler. Uh, but if you look at him uh, for his time as uh, a deeply racist Southerner, racist towards Asians, racist towards African-Americans, deeply racist. Doesn't speak well of Princeton either. No, no, and I won't get into that. I don't want to get into trouble, but <laughs> OK. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think his understanding of Europe was different. And that may be racist as well, looking at Europeans ethnically as a different race. And that's quite possible. I'm not a Wilson expert. But the way to um, not, not to uh, save him by any means at all, but the way to try to understand him, right? is, I think, from a social Darwinist view, right, that there are uh, hierarchies of ethnicities and groups, which most of us fortunately find detestable these days, but was certainly very much in vogue in the U.S., very, mm -hmm. very yeah. much. And uh, Europe was a place where he firmly believed that his views of ethnic nationalism and his views of diplomacy should apply so that Europe could settle down to a series of nations that would respect their borders, but that would include ethnically determined borders. But he had no sympathy towards Central America, right? The Costa Rica or such. Uh, no great sympathy towards Japanese or Chinese about that. So I think what we want to probably try to do is understand him and his racial views in the very common hierarchical mm. view of the time. Um, Birth of a Nation, of course, was screened in, in, his, in the White House, uh, and he loved that film. Um, <laughs> he said it was like writing history with lightning. Um, he certainly had a lot of the uh, lost cause Southern ideas, right, which had very limited of any compassion, right? It doesn't mean he would have supported slavery, but he certainly didn't support racial mm. equality. So in other words, he's, he's, no, he's no better. <laughs> but what but I think, see? though, that the, the idea of the League of Nations, 
Just the idea of that is a par powerful idea. And you saw over the past couple of days, the European leaders getting together and marching under their umbrellas. Yeah. Yeah. That is a League of Nations. Yeah, except okay. for Trump, who wouldn't well, go to the American Well, but please, remember, but please remember, the U.S. did not join the League of Nations. <laughs> Thank you. Right. It is a European Union. Yeah. So one of the, I mean, Japan wasn't a member. Uh, Germany was a member for a very brief time. Soviets were not members. Uh, the U.S. was not a member. That's why the U.N. is very different, if you want to talk about it. It's why the U.N. very self-consciously is very different. So the U.N. has a Security Council. And some people complain about that, but they forget that if the League of Nations had had such a Security Council, it might have been able to restrain, okay, possibly, potentially. The League of Nations really had no military force. I was guided by a, a... It was a loose association, more like. Well, it, it had very significant developments and things we just don't appreciate. A uh, big campaign against human slavery, big campaign for labor rights. But those, of course, are, are all overshadowed by the imagery of Haley Selassie going and appealing for help against uh, the Italians, or China appealing for help against Japan or Sudetenland. It did not, it did not prevent war. Yeah. Okay, that's true. Sure it did. But as a European Union for the 20s and 30s... It was unprecedented. And it also did, it, it did make constructive developments to a better life for a considerable number of people. But if the litmus test is there shouldn't be war again, by September 1st, 1939, there's a major European war again. Surely Wilson did not believe that this war would end all wars. I haven't, again, I'm not a Wilson scholar, so I haven't read his correspondence. I don't think anybody um, would say that this was absolutely the war to end all wars, but I think they might approach it, and again, maybe perhaps uh, your, your listeners will appreciate this. You know, there's war, I like war, there's I like peace, and there's I like wars that are manageable and controlled. It's like drones. You, you kill a lot of people with drones, and you kill a lot of people who are not combatants, but it seems it has the appearance of being manageable. Or really, an embargo is an act of war, but we seem to think that that's unmanageable. Okay, so I think if you sat down with Wilson, uh, the understanding was that this would be uh, the massive war to end other massive wars. And we just learn how to manage conflict. Right, right. Manage conflict, uh, like the United Nations. Uh, I know the, war, uh, the world does not seem very peaceful now, but the United Nations has had many successes, like the UN. Uh, you know, you negotiate. You would debate, etc. But again, as I just mentioned, without an army. Yeah. So the UN has an army. But what is really horrible is that it wasn't, what, 20 years from the time that Wilson said, this is a war to end all wars, <coughs> until we had a war that was way worse. It was, um, if you look at a calendar, um, it's what uh, Robert Graves called the long weekend, the English poet. Uh, I would say that it was probably, if you, if you want to be, um, uh, very precise, which I hate to be. But let's say uh, it was 1919 to 1941. Because in 1941, the horrible war became a global war. So before 1941, right, you had conflict in all the regions. But until Pearl Harbor, right, and the Germans declaring war on the U.S., and the Soviets invading, I'm sorry, the Germans and their allies invading the Soviet Union, you had three very lethal regional wars. Uh, 1941, some historians argue, and I, uh, I agree with them. <laughs> well, you look at what happened in 41. I mean, you look at those events. 41 was also Bobby R., the, one of the first large-scale murders of Jews, uh, just by weapons. Not yeah. you didn't need a camp or anything. You just shot. You just dug a ditch and you killed them. Completely civilian. Yeah. Um, by 41, France had fallen. So Vichy, France. So all these things were in place, right, to make 41 to 45. Um, I think, again, every, pretty much every historian would agree, the most lethal war more in the lethal, world. More lethal even than World War I. Including civilians. So not, the, the ways in which soldiers died in the Second World War were horrific. Horrific. I mean, the heat of New Guinea, right? Uh, the cold of, of Stalingrad were horrific. Um, and there were trenches. I think what's happened, and again, it, it, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just kind of popular perception. Uh, World War I was a soldier's war. World War II was a civilian war. But we want to remind ourselves, probably six million civilians died in the First World War. And 
you would have to say lots more than that. Yeah, I, yeah, I think more. if you included um, all the acts of repression, and maybe somebody's listening can correct me, um, you know, 18 to 20. Was, there was a, a morality issue, too. If you're going to fight somebody and, uh, and shoot a machine gun at them, that's one thing. It's war. It's soldier against soldier. Right. But if you're going to go after civilians and torture them and do all kinds of head trips on them, that's, that's a different morality. It is. But, and we see that in the First World War. We see that. It's not um, as well thought out, fortunately, right? Uh, the technology is there. But, um, of course, the, uh, the official Turkish uh, murder or genocide, depending upon, I mean, most, most of us agree it was a genocide. The Turkish government doesn't agree with that. Uh, that's clearly the kind of precedent for the Holocaust and other issues where uh, <coughs> civilians, uh, really, there's no strategic value. So that's, that's really what yeah. I wanted to get to here in the last few minutes anyway. And that is, what kind of shadow did this, this place, this, this initiate over the 20th century? Uh, what, how did it change the world? Uh, so now we had technology used for war, mm -hmm. and it was pretty bad. We had poison gas. We had airplanes that dropped bombs. We had medicine that we hadn't mm -hmm. had before. We had tanks. That was new. Uh, and I could go on. But um, there was a lot of technology that came into play that might not have come into play without World War I. Um, so that's a mixed bag. But then we had other things, like, like the morality questions and the human rights mm -hmm. questions that evolved. And it, it strikes me that you know, what happened in World War I sort of sent a message that you could do these horrendous things. You could have these horrendous wars and get away with it. And, and I think that, 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 that drew a shadow over the whole century, didn't it? Well, I would say that was a lesson that Japan, Italy, and Germany drew. Um, but they drew it in part because uh, the effort to prevent that was such a, a failure, right? It wasn't just the war experience but the outcome of the war. And I think we also want to remember that if you were uh, a French prime minister or an English prime minister, uh, you're asking to go to war again after having hundreds of thousands, if not millions, dead. I don't know if uh, you've seen the most recent Churchill film. Uh, it's, it's essentially oh, sure. about 40, the, the, the great hour, the grand hour or something. But anyhow. Yeah, the uh, greatest hour. The greatest hour. Yeah. Uh, so Chamberlain is a very interesting character. I mean, he's clearly driven by power, but he also clearly understands that um, England's not itching to go back to war. <laughs> there are people coughing, dying. Uh, as a professor at HPU, Professor Goff, who has, I think, five or six family members who either killed or wounded in that war. So we have to remember that, um, in a sense, it was uh, the expansionary powers challenging, but often challenging without the weaponry they would later develop. It's kind of like a poker game with the highest stakes imaginable. And so would Chamberlain respond? Well, you could say Chamberlain should have responded because the German Air Force wasn't the way they would be a year later. OK, but it's also true that the English did not have the high altitude oxygen systems for the hurricane and the Spitfire. So <laughs> that's why we need to go back and kind of peel away these very powerful terms like Munich, right, which still, have, still resonates, appeasement. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush actually referred to Munich with the first Iraq war. If you read his memoirs, he said one of the reasons okay. he went in to fight Saddam Hussein, who had invaded Kuwait, was his impression of Munich. <laughs> so these, these big wars have, have, have be, begot, be, they begot other wars. I mean, it's, it's sort of a proof of concepts sort of thing, that you can have a war, get away with it, humanity survives. So you learn a lot of things. You learn how to conduct the next war. You learn how to get on top of the situation militarily. You learn about weapons and threats and sort of the negotiation, the pre-war negotiation techniques and all that. And before you know it, you have another one. What, what have we learned since World War I that would have straightened us out on these things. Are we in better shape now or worse? Well, uh, let me cheat a little bit by saying since World War II, if that's okay. Fair enough. If that's okay. I, it's just not it's to It's Veterans Day. They well, died in both wars. Well, because I, I would contend that uh, we had a chance in the 20s and 30s, but for various reasons, it was not contained. Um, but after 1945, and this gets back to your point, um, a lot of the lessons were very poorly learned. 
So lessons among uh, imperial powers that had proved successful against the Axis did not prove successful against indigenous nationalist movements, uh, Vietnam, Algeria, etc. right? So you could say uh, in the 20s and 30s, they played around with what to do with tanks and planes. And in many ways, it was still a relatively conventional war. Battles mattered, right? But then you fast forward to the crucial decolonization wars of the late 40s, 50s, and 60s, and a lot of the West was still trying to fight conventional battles <laughs> or overwhelm with technology. Uh, uh, LeMay, who, of course, uh, helped firebomb Tokyo, also helped firebomb Southeast Asia. Okay, so you're right that you, know, you could learn, but you could also not learn, and you could also take the imprint and the um, template of a previous conflict and not understand that the next one is really not the same. British historians usually say the British High Command fights the last war. <laughs> They're always one war behind. <laughs> you know, they used to, uh, when they fought uh, um, some of the battles in the late 1870s, 1880s, they'd have red and blue uniforms marching across. So, of course, when they fought the Afrikaners, they had blue and red uniforms, and the Afrikaners picked them off one by one. Sure. Um, you see them behind the tree. Right, right. <laughs> so um, now, just to get back before our break, you mentioned sort of things that overshadow the 20th century. I also want um, us to remember that there are certain things I, I think we might uh, agree are good things that came out of these total wars. In other words, women's suffrage, clearly. The participation of women in the major uh, industries of war, munitions, etc. Sure. Clearly, now it's it's not the birth of the suffrage movement that was born 40 years before. Women elevated them, they but had it clearly jobs. they were they were. Relevant. Yeah, I mean, clearly, if you look at the United States and um, if you look at uh, political participation of women in the Weimar Republic, if you look in Britain, I that's I mean, good is not a as a word that historians often use. Um, but let's say that there was social change which led to a more participatory society. It's too bad that this couldn't happen without of the course. necessity of war. Absolutely. And, um, and I want to offer this thought to you, Peter, is that we study this period and then we look back, look forward, uh, crank in nuclear weapons and all the process, crank in all the wars that still happen, which we read about every day. Um, it seems to me that from the point of view of a history professor, of history in general, war is a central thread of history. It is a central thread, but it, as I talk with my students, uh, it's not an inevitable thread. And sometimes because of the persistence of war and the way in many cases war is glorified, commemorated. I mean, there's a debate about what we should be doing today and yesterday, uh, whether we should be commemorating war and uh, commemorating nations or whether we should choose a really more international approach. All these things are open. Um, so I, I tend to ask my students uh, to not look at things as inevitable. One of the things that uh, strikes me is uh, two years ago, my wife and I went on a trip to uh, France uh, around the periphery of it, and we stopped at the American Cemetery in Normandy. And it blew me away, as few experiences in my life, to stand there and see the, the archway, the, the structures they built, to see all those graves, American graves, to see how beautifully manicured it is, and um, you know, to see it come come alive, if you will, and um, it's very powerful experience. Americans buried in France, mm -hmm. a very powerful experience, and that's why I'm you know troubled by the fact that Trump didn't want to go to the American Cemetery, 55 kilometers north of Paris, the other day. Uh, there's a certain you know, important statement there. Oh yeah, but, Reagan gave one of his most famous speeches. <laughs> Yeah. At Normandy, yeah. But, you know, the most, I think the most, you can agree or not, mm. <laughs> the most important thing about Veterans Day, uh, and maybe Veterans Day isn't the only holiday that, that deals with this, uh, is to remember all those troops that were killed, all those people that were killed, young boys, mostly, mm -hmm. in those graves, and to think, gee, that, that wasn't a great way to end. Uh, can't we avoid the, that loss of, of humanity in the future? Um, that, that really speaks against war, as powerfully as anything I can think of. What do you think? Uh, I could not <laughs> disagree with you. 
I, uh, the only way I would disagree with you is I would like as much attention to be paid to the soldiers who survive. We tend to spend a lot of time thinking about graves and sacrifice, etc. Uh, there are a lot of veterans um, who need our attention. And I'm going to say something uh, else, which is probably a contrarian. Um, if, if war is an act of patriotism and sacrifice, um, so is peace activism. So we should remember also the peace activists who were arrested, the peace activists who were beaten up. Uh, they're both, I think Macron was trying to work on this yesterday, that true patriotism uh, is uh, the higher value. And that higher value, if you oppose a war, is not to denigrate the soldiers, it's to denigrate war. And sometimes those soldiers don't have a choice but to go to war. So I would agree with you, it's, it's overwhelming. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it's overwhelming by uh, romanticizing war. Or they, you could see how some politicians, they did this and look, we're not being paid back properly, right? As if there was some debt. I think the debt we owe them is to ensure that their children are treated properly and that we try not <laughs> to have war, that we try to, you know, take those swords and break them into plowshares as much as possible. So one of the essential elements here about, about Armistice Day and about Veterans Day and all that is to remember. And it strikes me that we don't remember. We don't, people are not conscious mm -hmm. <clears throat> of, um, you know, of, of, of Armistice Day, the end of World War I, or for that matter, the end of World War II. <clears throat> and they forget so quickly. <clears throat> And at the moment when these wars end, we have a great moral upswell. People who say, no more war. Mm -hmm. This was too hard. Let's make peace. Let's everyone make peace. But you look 20 years later, they forgot that already. So it really behooves us to celebrate 100 years later. Right. I think so. Happened. And, and uh, just like you, please remember, not everybody forgot. <laughs> yeah. Right. The 20s and 30s was also filled, for example, in 1928. A significant number of countries, including the U.S., signed the Kellogg-Briand Pact to outlaw war as a political instrument. I mean, the, the lesson I, uh, to the 20s and 30s is about um, American participation in international peacekeeping and uh, American and Western participation in uh, confronting military expansion <laughs> and fascism, uh, preferably some other way than war. Uh, but there are a lot of, the, there are different lessons in the 20s and 30s, and there was really a great deal of hope um, that, you know, 1939 would be limited. There was never the enthusiasm of 1914, um, but, you know, 1939 quickly became 1941, and then there was no sense that there was really a limit to this war. One other last point. Mm -hmm. I, I can't resist asking you one more question. Of course. Um, if you wanted to avoid war, you need national leaders, global leaders, who, who tell you not to do that, <clears throat> who make it part of their platform to say, no, don't do that. Uh, and the more lofty they are, the more respected they are, uh, the, the better the pulpit. And, you know, it seems to me that one way to avoid war going forward is to have leaders who run on that promise and who can execute on that promise. We don't have that now. But at least theoretically, don't you agree that you, you have a significant control, a minimization of the possibility of war if you have leaders, especially from the U.S., who work on that issue? I think leadership is important, but so is uh, civil society, uh, us getting together, uh, rubbing elbows, um, working with other people. Um, where society, not necessarily the state or, the, or leaders are strong, where society is strong and equal. Uh, where society spreads the benefits, you're much less likely. Now, my great concern, and this is nothing profound, is certainly with climate change and questions of water. I'm even more and more worried now about inequality, and particularly with natural resources, uh, places like Africa and such. And I and, and I see that inequality leads to war. Doesn't I think that I think this kind of inequality is is going to. It's going to lead to expansion. It's going to lead to famine. It yes. Um, and I don't want to make a uh, political claim as in a particular leader, but it seems that some of the key leaders uh, of today's world have actually gone back to pre-1914 in the sense that they've decided 
there are regions in the world, Russia gets to do what it wants in its region, China gets to do what it wants in its region, the U.S. gets to do what it wants, and that's kind of a big uh, power. There used to be a game called Diplomacy, Avalon Hill, it's, and that worries me a bit, um, and more, actually more than a bit, uh, that, that essentially what happens in each region is okay as long as the regions don't come to battle. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of uh, ethnicities and groups are potentially going to be horribly damaged by that. And again, I'm not talking about any particular leader. I'm, uh, it just seems to be the schema of the way people look at the world rather than internationalism. You know, <clears throat> wars tend to clear that up because at the end of a war you say, gee, that was a big mistake. We're not going to do that again. I hope so. Uh, <clears throat> and and yeah. I hope we can get to that kind of mentality without having a war. That'd be nice. That'd Thank be very you. nice. Thank you very much. Great to talk Thank to you. you. As always. Thank you. As always.